New Orleans was racist. When was that? Well, maybe this is just a little clickbait to get some people to watch this, but this is going to be a serious topic, and I uh, want to start it off by showing this record, and then I'm going to tell a little tale about it. Bunk Johnson and his Superior Jazz Band. Traditional jazz, Dixieland. This is a record that inspired me, that motivated me because of the topic we're talking about here, among other things. Now, this wasn't my first traditional jazz or Dixieland record. Uh, my father played all kinds of music. He liked that kind of music. I liked it. I liked all kinds of music, and I had uh, all kinds of music. One of the records I've shown in another video, not talked about it much, Red Nichols, Blues and Old Time Rags, Red Nichols and the Five Pennies. I bought this record new in 1962. This record I bought about 1966, maybe. This record was issued in 1962. What's the story on this record? Well, what happened with the traditional jazz guys is similar to what happened with the rock and rollers going after the old time blues guys when they started finding out about the roots. Even before the rockers started looking for the blues guitarists, the traditional jazz guys were going back and trying to find old timers, particularly from the New Orleans area that were still around and a couple of the young kind of college kid researcher types like got involved in the blues later on. They found Bunk Johnson. He was a trumpet player from the 1920s, not one of the famous guys, but well known in the New Orleans area. And they discovered him working the fields and so forth. And uh, of course, all of these guys' work just ended when the Depression hit. So through the 1930s, they didn't have anything going on. And uh, early 40s, uh, this rec the beginnings of this record, 1942. So in the early 40s, they found Bunk Johnson. He didn't have a horn. He didn't even have any teeth. Well, you can't play a trumpet without teeth. They got him some false teeth. They got him a horn. They had him practice. And in June of 1942, some guys from New Orleans, Bill Russell, one of the old-time scholars from that era, some guys from the West Coast, the guys that did this record and so forth, they showed up in New Orleans at Bunk Johnson's house, had him play a little bit for him. He had been practicing for a little while, had his teeth fit so he could wear them a while and sounded pretty good. Let's put together a recording. So Bunk knew some of the old time guys that were still around, one of which was George Lewis, top notch clarinet player, and some other guys. If you're interested, you can get more into this. But here's what happened. Okay, they got a group together. They're going to do a recording. At that time, there were only two, 1942, there were two top recording studios in New Orleans. <clears throat> they went, I get, even all these years later, I get emotional thinking about this. They went to the top studio not going to let black guys in the studio. They go to the second studio. Same story. The music that made New Orleans famous, the roots of all American popular music, and the guys that created it couldn't even get in a recording studio. Apologize, folks. Uh, I just can't talk about this without getting emotional. At that point, I decided... I was championing this music. This was going to be my music. Uh, and I spent uh, the majority of my musical inter interest, not all of it, but a lot of it, for 40 years and more, 
researching this music, listening to this music, promoting this music, a little bit of recording some of this music. And, uh, but this was what got me started. I said, okay, that is some kind of injustice. It's unbelievable. And I'm going to champion the music, and that's what I did. Well, uh, some good came from this project. Uh, I forgot the end of the story. So what did they do? They found somebody that had a portable acetate home-style recorder, they rented a hall upstairs of a store, and this record was recorded on a home recorder. Uh, they used 12 acetates, and uh, they were then issued on 78s. And, of course, this record came out in 1962. It has tons of notes, good time jazz, inner sleeve, full of notes, uh, interviews with Bunk Johnson and about it. Uh, lots of information on the front, on the back. So these were done uh, in 1942, and this record was released in 1962, and then a little bit later I read this and I got into it. And uh, you'll be hearing more about that because the most important person from that time was Jelly Roll Morton, and I'll be doing a big issue on that before too long. Uh, I have somewhere lost my copy of this over the years. I picked this one up again. The previous owner got five stars on it. He liked this record, and it sounds pretty good for a home recording on acetates in an in a empty room in 1942. So I was off and running then, and one of the good things that happened from this, this revitalized the careers of a lot of these guys if they ever had any. Uh, playing on this was, of course, Bunk Johnson and George Lewis, who went on for a long time, Jim Robinson on trombone, who had a good career for a long time, Lawrence Marrero on banjo, he went on and did good, and a few of the other people did good. So what came of this is, uh, in some later years, what was created in New Orleans Preservation Hall. Of course, uh, down in the part of town where all the tourists and everybody goes, I went... Uh, to New Orleans in the summer of 1970, and one of the places I had to go was Preservation Hall. So this hall was opened up down in the district and uh, uh, give the guys a place to play, and uh, that's one of the place tourists had to go to go in there, fairly small place. It's still, I think, in the same place today all these years later. But it gave all of these guys a job, and more than that, it gave them some notoriety. So this is uh, the Preservation Hall Jazz Band, New Orleans. Well, this is a group of guys. There were literally dozens and dozens of different musicians, old-timers in New Orleans, whoever was available, whoever was healthy, whoever was around. And a few of them had enough success, they put their own groups together and, and made a few records that way. But the even better thing, if any of you live in an area where you have a town hall concert, I can guarantee Preservation Hall Jazz Band has played your hometown concert music series more than once. They've been everywhere all over the world. And it's been great. And, of course, the guys now might be related to some of those old-timers. But, uh, again, uh, good music. These are, uh, in a lot of cases, what I would call maybe second-tier players. They're, they're not going to be uh, the kind of quality of people like Jelly Roll Morton and the people he had in his band and some of the people that came later on. But it was great. These guys were able to get a job. One more little story here, because I know some of you say, well, you don't like Dixieland. I'll maybe talk a little bit the different kinds of music in the future. You don't like traditional jazz. You don't like blues. Well, here's a little story. Before the turn of the century, ragtime originated down in that part of the country, and uh, 
by 1909, the blues were becoming established fairly well. A lot of the publications, say 1912, when the first four blues sheet music were published. But uh, after around uh, 1910, Ragtime and the blues got married. They had a baby. About 1917, the baby was called Jazz. <clears throat> and you say you don't like this or that or whatever. Well, the music you're listening to, the tap root of the tree is jazz, blues, and ragtime. So it's just a different genre off of that tree that you like. And I apologize for being a little emotional here today, folks. But uh, hopefully... Uh, You'll get a little appreciation for this music and uh, enjoy the video. So, thank you for watching.